John chapter 13. You have an outline in the scripture, I mean in the bulletin, and that will help you as we go along. We begin a new series uh, this morning. It is the words of Christ in John 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17, those chapters. Particularly those, we'll be looking at some other uh, parallel passages such as tonight in Luke. Uh, that are a part of this, uh, this time of Jesus in the upper room, mostly with the disciples, but then also on the way to the place of prayer. But certainly all taking place before uh, the cross on the next day. And I've entitled this series, very simple title, but Christian Essentials. I mean, his last night with the disciples, not the last time he would speak to them, I understand that, but a time of unrushed teaching, Many times, you know, after this, Jesus will be at the mercy of those who have arrested him. But in these moments, hours together, uh, he, he set the agenda. And so that's why I say unrushed time of teaching, the fact that we would have it unfolded to us in, in five chapters in John, I think, shows us that. Charles Spurgeon said of today's passage... John 13, 1 through 17, in his devotional Bible. And if you have that or have ever seen it, it has passages of Scripture. And then a few comments by Charles Spurgeon. Well, here's what he wrote after uh, verses 1 through 17 in John 13. No comment is needed, and we have given none. Let us practice what is here so clearly taught. In other words, the lesson of this passage is obvious. And it is this. No matter who you are, no matter how important you become, you are to be a servant of others. Now, some background is helpful. After travelers uh, had come some distance where they would stay, the host would normally provide water uh, that they could use to wash their feet. That was a sign of, of hospitality. You might remember Jesus said to Simon the Pharisee who had invited him to a meal, and during that meal, uh, he was criticized because he allowed a sinful woman to wash his feet uh, with her tears and dry his feet with her hair. You might remember Jesus said to Simon, you gave me no water for my feet. It was the custom. It was part of hospitality. So customarily, a host provided guests with water for washing their own feet. Uh, foot washing was regarded as such a lowly task, it was not even required of a Hebrew slave uh, to perform it. And this helps us to understand uh, another passage earlier, much earlier in John, when John the Baptist said in humility, I am unfit, I am not fit to stoop down and untie the thong of Jesus' sandals. What he was talking about, I'm, I'm not fit to, to wash his feet how great he is. And it helps us to understand the response of the disciples as we go through the text, that this was, you know, this was something you did for yourself personally, or the lowest of slaves would do it. So we come first to the circumstances of Jesus' service. Let's just notice some things that are taking place here. Uh, first of all, the approaching cross and return of Jesus to heaven. Verse 1, now, before the feast of the Passover, Jesus, look at what it says, knowing that his hour had come, the approaching cross, and that he would depart out of this world to the Father, return to heaven. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Indeed, the hour had come very close. Uh, his physical life would end the next day on the cross, he would leave this scene of the upper room and go to the Garden of Gethsemane where he prayed in agony to God, contemplating his suffering of God's wrath for sin, not his own, for man's sin. He also knew that after his resurrection, he would return to heaven uh, and that his time with the disciples on earth was, was coming to a close and so what Jesus was personally facing, the cross the next day, notice that it did not distract him from the need and the opportunity to love his disciples. Knowing that his hour had come, that he would depart out of the world to the Father, 
having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. No, he saw these hours as a time uh, of loving investment into the lives of the men he had traveled with and ministered with for the last three years. We also see the presence of an enemy. During the supper, verse 2, during supper, the, the devil already, having already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, to betray him. So that's part of the scene. Um, and just know that um, Judas is present there at the table. The act of washing the disciples' feet included the one that Jesus knew was planning to betray him. He was going to show Jesus' enemies where they could find him later that night because he knew Jesus' pattern when they were in Jerusalem. And so the circumstances of Jesus' service, he knew what was going to happen and where he was going. He knew the presence of an enemy. And then, of course, there is who he is, verse 3. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come forth from God and was going back to God. Now, we're familiar with that verse, but I want you to see the significance of it. It is showing us who this is who, in just a moment, is going to wash the disciples' feet. He is God the Son with all authority. Uh, soon to be exalted at God's right hand. Notice that. The Father had given all things into his hands. He has all authority. He he had come forth from God, God the Son. He was going to be exalted at God's right hand. He was going back to God. By far, he's the most important person in the room. If anybody's going to wash feet, it shouldn't be him, culturally speaking. And it is. So we see the humility of Jesus' service, beginning in verse 4. Jesus got up from supper, laid aside his garments. I think there's a picture there. We'll talk about that at the end. Laid aside his garments, and taking a towel, he girded himself. He assumed the position and the appearance of a servant. Then, verse 5, he poured water into the basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. So he came to Simon Peter. By the way, they would have been reclining uh, pillows or or such and, you know, their, their heads toward a central location where the meal was. And so Jesus is going around this outer circle where the feet are, you know, that's the picture. And he came to Simon Peter, verse 6, and said to him, Simon Peter said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Jesus answered and said to him, What I do you do not realize now, but you will understand hereafter. I believe Jesus is thinking of, of the cross and the fact that his washing of their feet is a picture pointing to the fulfillment of, or is a fulfillment of Isaiah 53, showing him to be a servant and pointing people to that passage where he would become the next day the suffering servant who would die as a sacrifice for sin on the cross. So, Peter, you don't realize it now, but you'll understand it hereafter that I'm in the role of a servant. In this act, especially tomorrow at the cross, and you're going to recognize the fulfillment of prophecy there. Peter said to him, verse 8, never shall you wash my feet. Well, Peter is who Peter is, and we're thankful for that because when he responds um, off the cuff, so to speak, it's helpful to us because we see how Jesus handles it. He's objecting to what in his mind is too great a violation of roles. That Jesus, his master, would wash his feet is unthinkable to Peter. Remember the culture of that. He and the other disciples still thought, we know this, still thought in terms of position. 
Luke bring this, brings this out by recording a dispute that occurred sometime during the evening in the upper room. Luke twenty two twenty four. There arose also a dispute among them as to which one of them was regarded to be greatest. And Jesus said to them, the king of the Gentiles lorded over them, and those who have authority over them are called benefactors. In other words, you're acting like uh, Gentiles. You're acting like the kings of the Gentiles, like the world, thinking of yourself, looking for recognition, looking for the power of position, looking for the prestige of titles. And Jesus goes on and says, it is not this way among you, with you. But the one who is greatest among you shall become like the youngest, must become like the youngest, and the leader like the servant. For who is greater, the one who reclines at the table or the one who serves? Is it not the one who reclines? But I am among you as one who serves. So in Luke, in the same context, that teaching takes place and is helpful to us here. Peter says, never shall you wash my feet. Indeed, the heart of servanthood is always thinking of someone else's need, not position. Peter was stuck on position. This is just not right, Lord. But yet it was right. Jesus answered him, if I do not wash you, you have no part with me. We appreciate Jesus' answers to Peter because they are to the point. Peter and all of us have to receive the humble, sacrificial service of Jesus for salvation is by grace, not our merit. And if we can't humble ourselves, as he's calling Peter to do in this physical sense with foot washing, if we cannot humble ourselves to receive the kind of love Peter couldn't imagine, well, even more unimaginable is the cross then, as Jesus said, you have no part with me if you cannot humbly receive what he, the Lord of all, humbly did for you on the cross. So this is a picture of that. And this is a call to humble faith that the cross requires. The truth of Christ's humiliation to be our servant must be received in order for any to be cleansed of our sin. In order for any Christian to honor him in life, we must understand not only the foot washing, but what that pointed to, the cross of Christ. If I do not wash you, you have no part with me. Peter misunderstood, verse 9. Simon Peter said to him, "Then, Lord, then wash not only my feet, but also my hands and my head. He's missing the point. The point is not clean feet, uh, or as Peter is thinking, that the washing by Jesus is somehow spiritually cleansing. The point is Jesus' servanthood. That's the point. Yes, washing feet is always a need in, in that type of an area where you're walking on roads that were dusty and and pathways and so forth. Um, But that's not the point, physical cleanliness. No, the picture of servanthood. So it's not a bath that's needed, Peter. Verse 10, Jesus said to him, He who is bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean, and you are clean, but not all of you. He wasn't talking about a part of Peter's body. He was talking about one of the individuals around the table. He picks up on Peter's misunderstanding, assures him that he is spiritually clean, but declares not all of them are. Of course, he is speaking about Judas Iscariot, who would betray him. Verse 11, he knew the one who was betraying him. For this reason, he said, not all of you are clean. And when he had washed their feet and taken his garments and reclined at the table again, let me just stop there and say, the picture here is saying that his serving them did not make him less than them, did not make him less than who he was 
in heaven before he became the God-man. He was their master throughout. And so as he took off his garments and took the role of a servant, he was their master. He comes back and puts his garments back on and takes his seat at the table. He is indeed the same person, their master. We learn then that no matter who we are or what position we hold, humble service is the right response to the needs of others. Now, I understand sometimes you're in positions where you make a call to get things done. I understand that. But none of us are beyond helping someone else. That's the practical lesson here in any way that would be needed. That's just who Jesus wants us to be in our servanthood one to another. So we come to the lesson of Jesus' service, verses 13 through 17. He wants them to understand. He said to them, the end of verse 12, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher. And, and, I, and by the way, teacher with divine authority is not just saying a teacher, but like they recognized his teaching at the Sermon on the Mount, one who taught like no one else with authority. So you call me teacher and Lord. I think using Lord here as a title of, of, of deity, uh, often, most often, it is used that way uh, in the New Testament, not always. When it's talking about people, it can be uh, talking about a title of, of a person. Uh, but in this case, you call me teacher and Lord, and you are right. I teach with divine authority. I am the God-man, for so I am. And by the way, literally there in the Greek, it's one of those I am statements. It's not so I am, it's for I am. And of course, that makes us think of the name that God gave to Moses. I am who I am. Jesus used that often, uh, deliberately saying, I am equal with God the Father. And so he says it here, right after he does an act of service that no Jew would have done. If I then, the Lord and the teacher, washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. So what are we to take from that? We are to take no service is beneath us in loving one another. That's the practical lesson. And Jesus wants the church to picture that. That's what he wants. Loving service one to another. That it always be a part of what is portrayed. And it points people, of course, to the greatest act of service that happened the next day at the cross. For I gave you, verse 15, gave you an example that you should do as I did to you. Humbly love, humbly serve one another. Are there any exceptions to that? Well, not on this night. Jesus washed Judas' feet, whom he knew would later lead soldiers to the Garden of Gethsemane to arrest him. So I'm going to say, no, I, I think the idea is no, no exceptions to what we do to serve and no exceptions to who we do it for in the body of Christ and if we are having opportunity to serve elsewhere. Verse 16, truly, truly, I say to you, a slave is not greater than his master, nor is one who is sent greater than the one who who sent him. So Jesus is saying to not follow his example of servanthood is, is like a slave not following his master's directions. There's something obviously wrong about that. To not follow Jesus in servanthood is like an ambassador from uh, our president deciding on his own to change foreign policy. There's something obviously wrong if that were to take place. So it is wrong for you and I to portray Christianity with anything other than this servant attitude and testimony as a part of our lives. 
It's impossible for us to to completely understand and obtain this humility, but it is what Jesus calls us to. And he keeps calling us to it. So I say again, it is wrong for us if we portray Christianity with anything other than this manner of servant attitude and testimony. And he says to us, if you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. In other words, humbly serving one another it blesses you, it blesses the congregation, it keeps us within the blessing of God. Someone has said we can, I'm sorry, I don't know who it is, but um, I have this quote, we can found our life either on giving or on getting. But the plain fact is that if we found it on getting, we shall miss both the friendship of man and the reward of God. I think that's true. I think the greater danger for a Christian is you you don't show forth the love of Christ, which he is calling you to show forth. Implications, two, two big ones. First of all, the practical lesson, and that is to serve one another. Because Jesus is leaving behind these who would be the nucleus of, Uh, along with 120 others, of the church. And he wants this church to image him. Now, throughout history, the church has done that imperfectly, but we keep coming back to these principles that he leaves the disciples. And it would have been great to have been in this room, but we are invited into this room, as I'll say tonight as we look at Luke. We are invited into this room purposefully by God inspiring these chapters in the book of John to get this lesson right. So the practical lesson, serve one another. And here's some things we learn through the text. What you are personally facing may mean someone should be serving you. Okay, we could say that about Jesus. They should have been serving him in his hour. He's going to show forth what an hour of need it was at Gethsemane as he prays. What you are personally facing may mean someone should be serving you, but it doesn't mean you don't have to serve others. In his hour of need, or at least coming up upon it, he takes his outer robe off and serves. Secondly, the presence of enemies should not quench a servant's heart. Okay? Okay? And, you know, maybe the word enemy, to, to make it more practical, that person you're having difficulty with should not quench a servant's heart. No matter who you are or how important you become, you are to be a servant of others. In fact, position may give you greater opportunities to serve. Another point here under the practical lesson, the attitude and action of a servant are highly noticeable in a self-conscious world. So a servant is a most effective witness. Now, do not get me wrong. It is not that we serve and do nothing else out in the community and people somehow understand the gospel from that. They, the gospel is pictured in that to some degree, but no, we speak as well. But it can certainly open up opportunities to speak. It can give us that footing by which someone might listen to the gospel. The attitude and action of a servant are also noticed in today's church and serve to stir others up to love and good deeds. So we know some of the examples, but just to get your mind stirred with examples, to pray for others, providing a meal, noticing and speaking to guests or those who tend to stay to themselves. Do that. And you that are gifted with the ease of doing that, make that your mission on Sundays. Nursery work. If you've got one in the nursery, thank them for their service today. Contacting those that you haven't seen, showing that kind of care that you would look around today and notice someone's not here. And you would take the next step of 
finding out why. Is everything okay? Just wanted to know. Or we have a few always throughout church, any church's history, there are always a handful or more that are homebound, remembering them, visiting, calling the homebound. Those are some of my examples. You have others. Jot them down. It might be God showing you how you are to be a servant, how you are to practically apply this lesson. But there is the spiritual lesson as well. And I think all of this is pointing us to receive, make sure we have, receive Jesus' service on the cross. Taking the role of a servant, he clearly links himself to the prophecy of the suffering servant in Isaiah 53. Uh, A well-known passage of Scripture, well-known especially to us because we get it, we know he was uh, prophesied there, but we need to understand that his service to the disciples was, was linking him there. I think that's part of Peter understanding it more later. Secondly, removing his outer garments symbolizes, I believe, the extreme humility of laying aside his manifested glory in heaven. A much greater humility to do that. Oh, we think he, he disrobed. And that, is, that was great humility in that culture. But cosmically, leaving behind the glory of his manifested presence in heaven was a greater humility. And he did so to become a man so that he could take upon himself the death penalty for sin. Washing feet symbolizes a greater cleansing work that he would do upon the cross. He took our sin upon himself, died for it, spiritually, experiencing God's wrath in those hours that he was alive upon the cross and died for it physically, breathing his last, actually dying on the cross. He paid sin's penalty that God might justly forgive sinners. And that's available. So the servant, God the Son, who knew no sin, who was glorious in heaven, shed his heavenly glory to come, to die for sin, that others might be forgiven. Other scripture tells us we don't automatically receive the benefit of that. We're not automatically forgiven because Jesus did that or because we read it and even understand it. We're not automatically forgiven. No, God will convict your heart to understand that you've sinned against him and that he will judge you eternally and that he is righteous and has a judgment that you will never measure up to. He will lead you to understand you must repent of your personal sin and personally Place your trust in Jesus alone for salvation. That's what the washing of the feet pictures, that great service upon the cross. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you. We ask, Lord, that you would bless us in this lesson to become, to grow in service one to another and to others in the world around us that we can be ambassadors that represent you well and that can do acts of love that point to uh, your greatest act of love upon the cross. We pray that. I pray that you would speak to the heart of anyone here who may be familiar but has not yet placed faith in Jesus. Would you lead them to that place of repentance and faith? In Jesus' name.